so I'm talking about capital theory today, and just so you understand, it would probably be more appropriate if the title of what I'm going to say were capital and interest, okay? And it's not that I'm incapable of, you know, coloring within the lines, but rather that those two topics tend to go hand in hand, especially in Austrian theory. So if you remember Dr. Herbner's lecture yesterday, he was getting into capital theory even though he was supposed to be talking about interest, okay? So the two overlap, like I said, especially in the Austrian school. The other um, caveat I want to bring up before I get into it is that uh, capital and interest theory has been referred to as the black hole of economic theory. Okay, even outside the Austrian school, that wasn't an Austrian who said that. And the idea is that, so on the one hand, what does it mean? It means that people, economists who go into this area never get out. Okay, they get sucked in. Um, and just as an illustration of that, Friedrich Hayek has this book, perhaps some of you have seen it, called The Pure Theory of Capital, which is an extremely technical work. And um, he tries to go through and really talk about the relationship between uh, consumption goods and capital goods and all the sort of things we can derive, the principles we can derive from that. And the, the pure in that title means without worrying about money. Okay, so like in a state of barter, we would still have capital goods and consumption goods, and let's analyze that. And then he says in the foreword or the introduction that at some later date, I want to come back to this and, and finish my thoughts in this area and, and do, you know, include monetary theory and, and give a, a grand theory to explain it all. And he never went back to that. He went on to give a theory of, of the you know, nervous system and things like that. He thought that was an easier thing to do than to finish um, <laughs> this work on capital theory. And just to uh, give you a, a more personal anecdote to show you the dangers of trying to, to do work in this area, when I was at Hillsdale uh, for my job interview, they, um, you know, they want you to give a talk. So there's, for those of you who don't know, when you go to try to teach at a school, you get one-on-one -on -one interviews, and then you've got to give a presentation to the group of the relevant faculty. And I was just out of grad school at the time, and so I really didn't have anything to present except something from my dissertation, which was a pretty technical, esoteric topic from capital theory. And so I'm doing my presentation on this. And one of the guys in the audience was an accounting professor, and he was, he was a really good athlete, and he like, bikes to work every day on a 10 speed. He's like 6'5 and rail thin and so forth. And he had this watch that also kept track of his heart rate so that, you know, if he's riding on his 10-speed, he can see what's my heart rate and so on. And he told me afterward, we're friends now, but he told me afterwards that, um, he said, yeah, Bob, during your talk, about halfway through, I just happened to glance at my watch. And at that precise moment, my heart rate was the lowest that I've ever seen it. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I had, you know, apparently almost induced a coma in this uh, man. So hopefully that won't happen today. Uh, but... Anyway, so that's, so basically I'm covering myself to just say it's, it's, this is a difficult area. So the first uh, distinction I think we need to make is when we start talking about capital, there's really two different things people could have in mind. So on the one hand, you might mean capital goods, or you might mean a capital fund. Okay? And so if... If this is what you mean, then when you, sit, when you start talking about, oh, just capital, you mean physical machinery, uh, hammers, nails, things like that, and that's what you mean by capital, whereas the other meaning, a lot of times people would say they're talking about capital, and really what they mean is the amount of money invested in a certain enterprise. Okay, so the, this is a sort of physical, technical concept, whereas that is a monetary or financial concept. Okay, and so the, the danger is, and what many economists often do is that they will use the term capital interchangeably for both of these concepts and then within the same argument they'll be starting out and be saying true statements if we mean this and then they'll derive conclusions you know with meaning that and so the arguments invalid because they've implicitly switched what they mean by the term capital and the Austrian school is very good about being precise as what they mean especially Ludwig von Mises that in almost any discussion, at least in human action, where he's talking about capital, he's very clear, does he mean capital goods or does he mean um, a fund of money? And so just to give you a bit more specific definition for the capital fund concept, the, well, let, let's picture if we have somebody who owns a laundromat, for example. And so if you said to this person, you know, how much capital is in your business, if you meant the, what you probably mean by that is the, the right-hand concept, meaning 
uh, what you might mean is, okay, if you were to liquidate your business, just sell it over to somebody else, how much money could you get for it? Okay, so that's one concept that you might mean. Or you might mean if you were to go out of business and sell off all of your assets and then pay off all of your creditors at that point, then you know how much money would you have left over? And so maybe that's what you mean by saying how much do you have invested, how much capital is in your business. Whereas if you meant this, then the person might say, oh, well, I have you know, three uh, heavy-duty washing machines, and I've got two dryers, and I've got a cash register, and I've got a su surveillance system, and I have the building in which you know, my, the people come and, and do their laundry. And so that would be the distinction. Okay, so one implication just from making this distinction that we can see is this issue of aggregation. And so... What will happen is economists outside the Austrian school will try to add up and come up with a number and say, you know, you want to be able to say something like, the United States has more capital than India does. And if that's all you want to say, you don't want to go farther than that, okay, fair enough, we all understand the sense in which someone could mean that. But if you want to get more precise and quantitative, well, then you have to say, well, what do you mean by saying capital? And so if you mean the, cap the left-hand concept, well, it's a bit problematic because certainly the U.S. has more of certain types of capital goods than people in India. But maybe, and I don't know enough about India, but I'm sure there are types of tools and equipment that are used there in which those people probably have a greater number than what we have over here. So just to give you a silly example, if we're thinking about screwdrivers, most businesses in the United States probably use the, the power ones. You, know, you just pull the trigger and you've got the battery pack and it automatically goes, whereas perhaps there are more um, old-fashioned screwdrivers in use in the businesses in India. Well, so, um, but see, that, is that a capital good or is that land? That's, um, <laughs> so, so that's, I'm um, just raising the, the issue there that when we, that these capital goods, if you want to be very careful about it, when you talk about oh, how, what, how much capital is in a country, if you mean this concept, Technically, what you would have to do is list out every type of equipment and tool and so forth, and then how many numbers of each you have, and that's, you wouldn't be able to reduce it all to some number. Okay? Now, what you could do, it would probably what economists mean if they, if they wanted to, in practice, compare the amount of capital between two countries or to say, you know, what's the rate of capital accumulation in the U.S. from 1950 to 1970 or something like that, what they really mean is let's add up the monetary value of all the capital goods and then, and then sum that all together and then see what happens to that total number over time. But the problem is if you start getting bigger than an individual business enterprise, if you start talking about the capital in the U.S., and you mean that right-hand concept, that the, the definition sort of breaks down. So Mises is very clear when he means the right-hand concept that the amount of capital devoted to a particular enterprise is just what I said earlier, that if they were to sell everything off, how much financial capital would they have when all is said and done? But if you say for the United States, for example, what does that mean? That if everyone in the United States sold off every asset they had, then how much total money would American citizens have left over when all is said and done? And at that point you wonder, is, does that even mean anything? Because presumably if everyone starts selling off everything, the prices are going to go down. And so that calculation is sort of meaningless. And what's really absurd is when people start talking about, you know, how much capital is on planet Earth and does that change over time, okay? Because who are we selling our capital to, all right? If there were Martians that we could conceivably sell everything to them, then maybe it would make sense to say, okay, let's take the market price of each thing and multiply by the number of units and come up with a grand total. But as I say, in, so in practice, this idea of aggregation, you have to be very careful. And the Austrians, um, as you can imagine, are very careful relative to other economists about not uh, making these mistakes. Okay, so that's the one distinction we need to make. But now I want to focus a little bit more on what do we mean by capital goods. And in earlier lectures, you heard the difference so that you know there's consumption goods and capital goods. But now we want to focus a little bit more on that and because the issue is okay we can give you these definitions but but why are we making them okay because we could also you know why aren't we talking about red goods versus blue goods we could give you a definition and we can talk about that but you can see well that's not really relevant to economic theory to make that distinction 
And so I want to spend a little time now to say, well, why is it that economists have made these distinctions between capital goods and natural resources and so forth? So just to give you some historical background, the classical school made the distinction between consumption goods and uh, factors of production, means of production. And then they further broke down the means of production into these three categories, so land, labor, and capital. And probably the main reason that they settled on, on these distinctions is that they thought this was going to explain the functional distribution of income. And so in particular, they thought that rent was what was paid to the owners of land and that wages were paid to the owners of labor and that interest was what was paid to the capitalists. Okay, so the, so the idea is if you're a worker, you earn wages. If you're a landlord, then you earn rent. And if you're a capitalist, then you earn interest. And that, you know, that's how they explained theoretically the money income that these people earned year after year. Um, just incidentally, as a side note, they might have called this profit, okay, because the classical school wasn't as clear as we are today about the distinction between pure profit and what we would call interest. And you haven't, I think, seen this in this week's lectures yet. I think uh, Joe Salerno is going to be talking about that today, later on today. And so I won't go into that now, but I just want to point out that often a classical economist, when he's saying profit, really means interest. Okay, so this is why the classical school, or one of the major reasons they made this distinction, was because they thought, well, we need to separate these things into these categories because this is the category that gets rent and, and so on and so forth. All right, now, in modern Austrian economics, we do make distinctions that are very close to these ones. They're a little bit more refined, but it's not because of this. All right, so this is wrong, or at least we no longer believe in that. And so that was the way the classical school thought, so I don't want to confuse you, but I just wanted to point it out just so you could see historically where these dis categories come from. And also, these, this uh, theory of the functional distribution of income, you can still see it today. Like the man on the street, I think, would tend to agree with these statements. And also, just the word rent, in economics, rent has a very specific meaning, but uh, the average man on the street, when you talk about, well, who, who is it that gets paid rent in society, he would think, oh, my landlord, I have to give him rent. All right, so that's uh, part to explain the way modern terminology has evolved in, in the man on the street. Okay, so what, what do the Austrians mean by these distinctions? Well, these two are the original means of production. Okay, and land is, could be more generally considered natural resources. Okay, so these are just the gifts of nature. Okay, so things like diamond mines and the oil in the ground and so forth. Stuff that, it's re, certainly resources, means of production, things that we can use to ultimately produce consumer goods, but they're just gifts of nature. Okay, and then labor means what everybody means by labor. And then capital, like I said, they would probably be more, more specific and, and realize that we're talking about capital goods. And so even for the Austrians, they would probably agree with the definition that you would hear, read in any uh, principles textbook is, you know, what's capital goods? And they say, oh, it's the produced means of production. Okay, so let's parse this definition. So the, the means of production part is just to distinguish it from a consumption good. Okay, so it's not um, a means of consumption. It's a means of production. So that's fine, fair enough. But then this word produced, that's to distinguish it from these two because, um, you know, in a sense, I'll keep you say God produced the minerals and so forth, but the distinction between what is it that really separates um, a hammer from a tree, and the idea is, well, a human being created the hammer. Okay, they're both means of production, but the, the hammer was created previously by human beings. And so that's why there's this distinction. Now, um, if you know a lot about Austrian theory, that might be, seem a bit puzzling at first glance because it seems to be backward looking. All right, so in Austrian theory, generally speaking, all the concepts and theories 
are treating the individual and what he or she is doing looking into the future because human action you can't change what's already passed all you can do is act in the present with the hope of influencing the way the future unfolds and so it's a bit strange that the definition of this would involve something that happened in the past okay so just to give you an example of what I mean if we've got some uh, Native American who's, who's going through the jungle and he sees or the forest and he sees um, this piece of wood that comes to a sharp point on the end and he picks it up and he realizes this would be very good for throwing it uh, at animals and killing them to that person does it really matter whether it was that this spear was produced by some other Indian in a different tribe who happened to drop it so then it would be a capital good according to this definition or suppose there was just a freak bolt of lightning that hit a branch and it just happened to come out and look like a spear in which case technically you'd say oh, well that must be a natural resource because no human being made it but as long as it's equally serviceable to that person it doesn't really matter what the history of this object is okay that he can just evaluate it and say well, you know I can use it in my plans for going out and, and killing animals and so Rothbard actually refines this a little bit and he clarifies and he said that really in, in terms of what do we need this for in our economics why do we have this category it's more correct not to call capital goods produced means of production but reproducible means of production okay and so the idea is what what really is the distinction in terms of economic theory in the Austrian school why we distinguish between natural resources and labor on the one hand versus capital goods is that capital goods if we needed to we could make more of them okay whereas uh, for example the oil in the ground is that as we use that up it's not that we can very easily just make more oil whereas if we're if all of a sudden there's an increase in the demand for hammers we can increase the production of hammers okay so now this is I'm just gonna make a little side point for those of you who are fairly well versed in the in the theory if, if you're a newcomer don't worry about this point I just want to explain where this comes in what Rothbard points out is that capital goods in the evenly rotating economy and again if you're new to Austrian economics you'll probably learn about this later in the week earn no net return okay and so for this to be true your definition of capital goods really needs to be this one that the thing is not is reproducible and if that's the case then it's not going to earn a net return in long run equilibrium and so what he means is like I said if we continue with that example if you're talking about hammers and all of a sudden the um, consumer demand changes and people want to buy more hammers then maybe there's um, the people in the hammer industry at least in the very short run are making a lot of extra money but because people can then just come in and rivals can start producing more hammers in the long run the return to you in the hammer industry it's not going to be any higher because of the change in demand whereas if all of a sudden there's an increase in demand for oil and you happen to be someone who owns a bunch of you know an oil well or so forth then your income can go up even in the long run okay because it's not that somebody's just gonna um, make more oil out of nothing and be able to to satisfy the increased demand okay so that's why uh, the Austrians still maintain these distinctions okay the last point I want to make on this before I go on to a specific example is that if you notice these these concepts that I'm talking about you might have thought initially that it has something to do with the the object itself that we can just look at an object and t discuss its physical properties and then say whether it's a capital good or whether it's a consumption good and that's not really true that economics especially Austrian economics is not so much about physical things but it's really about people's subjective attitudes towards physical things and so when it comes to classifying you know a particular object you want to say what is it it really you have to know well, what were the intentions of the valuing mind that wants to use this object and so uh, to give you an example if we're talking about a street musician so some guy let's just say he's in New York and he is sitting on the side of the street and he's, he has a guitar and he's just strumming it for his own satisfaction so that to him that guitar is a consumption good okay that he just plays it to you know enjoy the music and so forth but then all of a sudden if people are walking by and they start throwing money into his hat 
and he realizes, hey, I can actually use this guitar to get money, then all of a sudden he's become a producer, and that same physical guitar now is a production good, okay, because now he's realizing, oh, this is a means for me to earn income. All right, so it's not just studying the guitar and its properties, you wouldn't be able to say whether or not it's a consumption good or a capital good. You would have to know what are the intentions of the person using it. And to give you perhaps a more whimsical example, if we think about the diary of Anne Frank, okay, so the actual girl, when she's writing in her diary, that's certainly a consumption good. But then later on, when that thing somehow found its way into the hands of a publisher, he was looking at that and certainly not thinking, oh, I can record my innermost thoughts and, and desires in this book. You no, know, he was thinking, oh, if I mass produce the contents of this, you know, we could have a bestseller. And so for him, that same thing would be a capital good, whereas for Anne Frank, that thing was a, a consumption good. Okay, so just um, even though the tendency is with these things to think about the physical properties of the objects, again, we always want to be careful that no, it has to do with uh, subjectivism. Okay, so let me now talk a little bit about the relation between rent and capital value and interest. So if you remember, the, the classical economists thought that rent was what natural resource owners earned and that interest was what capitalists earned. And I crossed it out to remind us that no, that's not the way we think about it anymore. So let me go through some specific examples to try to illustrate more clearly the proper way to think about it. And what I'm going to be going over is really due to Frank Fetter. Okay, so he's, I think his name's up on the library upstairs, so he's considered a, uh, an Austrian economist. At the time, if you read contemporaries discussing him, they would often refer to him as a member of the psychological school. And what they meant by that was that he was one of these people who was really into subjectivism. Okay, so psychological school that he thought economics was about people's minds and, and subjective attitudes as opposed to people who are more on the technical side. Okay, and his book that's out there, uh, I think it's called Capital, Interest, and Rent. Th this is a collection of essays where he really goes through and lays out the view that I'm going to go over now. And so just to give you a specific concrete example, I'm going to suppose that there's this machine and it has three years of, of life in it, okay? It doesn't really matter what it's useful for, but if we want to be specific, let's say that it's used um, to make cars, okay? That, so the idea is if you're producing cars and you buy one of these machines, you will produce more cars with that machine than without, and so your total revenues will be higher. And so now the issue is how does somebody figure out what the both rental price and purchase price of this machine is? All right, so... What we can do here is list a few years, and then I'm going to have two rows of numbers. So the first one's going to be the rental price. So the idea is if you were to rent this machine out, how much could you get for it per year? And then the second row is going to represent the purchase price. Okay, and there's a spider on my notebook. Okay, so <laughs> so the the idea is just to um, make a certain assumption so we can be concrete about it. I'm going to assume that the way the contract works, if you're going to rent this machine out, is that you you rent it out for a year, and at the end of the year, the person renting it from you then pays you the marginal product, marginal revenue product at that time. Okay, so the, if you're the owner of the machine and you rent it out, the cash flow that you're going to perceive in the first year, you're not going to get anything. But then in 2005, the person's going to give you back your machine. It's now been used for a year, so it's a one-year-old machine. It's not brand new anymore. And then he's going to give, let's suppose, $1,000. Okay, because, and again, the why is he doing that? It's because he realizes that because using that machine in the course of the year, the monetary value of his increased production as measured in 2005 was $1,000 up till that point. And so um, with competition, that's what he's going to have to pay you for the reasons that Dr. Herbner talked about yesterday. 
and then you can do that for three total years. And then, though, at, at this point, though, the person gives you back the machine and it's completely worthless because it's, it's been used for three years now. And so if you tried to rent that out again, nobody would give you anything for it. So I'll just put a line there. If we kept drawing out years, it would be zero. So one way to think about it is that if you own this machine, it entitles you to a cash flow of zero dollars initially and then a thousand dollars in one year, another thousand dollars in two years, a third in three years, and then back to zero thereafter. Okay, so now the issue is, well, what would be the purchase price of this machine at various points in time? Okay, so if we bought it brand new right now, what would we have to pay for it? And then when the guy gives it back to us after one year, if we sold a one-year-old machine at that point, what price could we get and so on? Because presumably the price is going to go down over time since the machine at any given point is going to have fewer years of life in the future, but exactly how much is it going to go down? And to do that, we can't just answer that off the top of our head. We need to know what the prevailing market rate of interest is. And so I wrote that formula over there that uh, Dr. Herbner went over a little bit yesterday. And so that's just the general formula. It's just accounting. It's not anything to do with Austrian economics that the present discounted value of a cash flow where the Ds represent the dividends in various years in the future is given by that formula. So you just take the cash flow and then you divide by 1 plus R, where R is the interest rate. So if the interest rate is 5%, then R would be 0 0.05, and then you raise it to the appropriate power. Because a cash flow coming due to you in three years, you have to discount that over three years of the interest rate. All right, so that's the general formula. And then applying that up here, we can work backwards and, and figure out what would be the purchase price of this machine. So in the year 2008, at this point, the machine has no future cash flows, and so if you tried to sell it, you would just get zero dollars for it. And even in 2007, at this point, you're getting the machine back, and now it's worthless. And so again, at this point, its purchase price would be zero. And I'm going to assume a 10% rate of interest. Okay. And then now here the question is, in 2006, you've gotten the machine, it has one year of life left, so you know in 2006, next year, so you're going to rent it out, and one year from then, you're going to get $1,000 in cash and then have a worthless machine. So right now, if you wanted to sell it and raise money immediately rather than waiting a year, how much could you get for it? And so if, as I say, the market rate of interest is 10%, you would just use that formula. So it's 1,000 divided by 1.1, and that gives you 909.5. So, of course, I'm rounding, but the idea is if you sold it here, you would, have, you would get roughly $909 for it, nine cents. All right, and then the question is, okay, what about in this period? Well, if you look ahead, at this point, the machine is entitling you to two periods of cash flow, and so the formula for this would be 1,000 over 1.1, and then plus 1,000 over 1.1 squared, and if you figure that out with a calculator, it's 1735.54. Okay, and then finally, the original price with three future cash flows of $1,000 or future dividends is roughly 2486.85. Okay, now th just as a side note for those of you who are vaguely familiar with what I'm doing here, you could, you can put figure these out either by saying, like for this one, you can say, okay, use that formula for $1,000 coming due in one year and then another $1,000 coming due in two years. Or you can say, next year I'm going to have a total of $1,909.09 because I could rent it for one year, get my $1,000 and then sell it and have this much total money in 2006. Okay, so either way you do it, you're going to get the same number. Okay, and that makes sense because you have to be, it has to be equally attractive for you to rent the machine as it is for you to sell it because if it weren't, then that would, you'd, you know, if everyone wanted to sell the machine because it was more profitable to do that, then that would lower the price. And so it's got to be the case that either way you do the calculation, you get the same number. Okay, so this is the way you would price this machine using the standard formula from accounting. And so now the issue is, uh, coming back to more Austrian economics, what would 
what would be the rate of return on your investment? All right, so if you were a capitalist and you had some money saved up, some financial capital, and then you said, okay, what do I want to do with it? Well, one thing you could do is you could just go to the bank and lend them the money and then wait a year and then give you interest. But another thing you can do is invest in these machines because you say, wait a minute, if I just have 24, 86, 85, I can buy one of these machines brand new and then I can rent it out and next year I'll get $1,000 in cash from the person who rented it and then I can, if I want, sell the machine off. At that point it's a year old and its price has fallen to this and I'll have more total money here. I'll have $2,735.54 whereas here I started out with that. Okay, so if we wanted to figure out what's the rate of return on that investment, and again this is just simple accounting, the way you figure it out is you say, well, it's the dividend plus the change in the price of the asset divided by the initial price. And I'll just do one of these to give you the idea, and then we can uh, move on. So here it would be 1,000 plus 1735.54 minus 2486.85. And then all divided by the initial purchase price of the machine. And if you go through that with your calculator, it's roughly $248.69. So that's how much extra money you have from what you started out with. And then when you want to figure out, well, what's my rate of return, you divide by that. And as you can see, that's roughly 10% or 0.1. Okay, so. The idea is whether you give your money to the bank, you get earn 10% that way in a more typical loan contract, or if you invest in productive lines, you earn an implicit interest return on your capital. Okay? So that's something that you might not have realized, is you might think that, oh, if there's no profit opportunities in equilibrium, the total amount spent on inputs has to be exactly equal to the amount that you receive from the consumer. No, that's not true because everybody has to be earning an interest return on their invested capital. Okay, because just think about why would anybody invest in this line of production if this total amount of money were the exact same number as here? Because rather than earning a 0% return, I could just give my money to the bank. Okay, so the idea is if there's a prevailing positive rate of interest, the prices of capital goods and other inputs have to reflect the fact that people who buy them in a long production process need to be paid the rate of return of interest over time for their invested capital. Okay, so what we've so far established is that somebody who invests in this machine would earn 10% per year. And I won't go through it, but if you use this formula, you would see the same pattern holding out. Um, and another way to just see it quickly is if the guy buys this machine and holds it for three years, when all is said and done, even if he's just putting these cash payments under his mattress, he's going to end up with $3,000, whereas he only pumped in twenty-four eighty-six initially. So he ends up with more money than he put into it. And so that's what Bumbavark meant by the interest problem that uh, Dr. Herbner talked about yesterday, is how is it that capitalists can earn a return when they're not really, they're not really working. Okay? So all this capitalist has done has bought this machine, and yet he's earning these $1,000 payments over time. Okay, so... That's what the interest problem was, and one proposed answer for it to explain, well, why is it that this capitalist can earn 10% per year by investing in this machine, is people said, oh, it's because the machine is productive, all right? So that if you have this machine in your business, you produce more stuff than without it, and so naturally it follows that if you buy the machine and then wait three years, you're going to end up with more capital value than you started out with because the machine's physically productive. And that was the view that Bumbavark exploded in his uh, history and critique of interest theories, and he referred to that as the naive productivity theory. And Mises alludes to this in human action, so that's why I want to go over it. So if you read that part in human action, you'll understand what happens. So I think the easiest way to, to show you what the fallacy is in that argument is just to reproduce this same diagram, but now I will assume rather than a 10% rate of interest, suppose that the market rate of interest happened to be 0%. And so the, the cash flows are the same.
but now the issue is what would be the, the capital value or the purchase price of the machine if there's a 0% rate of interest. So again here, well it's 0, here it's still 0, but now here you're saying, okay, the machine at this point entitles me to $1,000 cash one year from now, so what's the present value? Well, using that formula, it's 1,000 divided by 1 plus 0, which is 1, and so it's just $1,000. And if you keep working backwards, you'll see that it just keeps going up by two or a thousand dollars every period. Okay, so the machine, if there's a zero percent rate of interest, the same machine is just as productive as it was in this scenario. The only thing I've changed is I suppose the market rate of interest is zero percent instead of ten percent. And so now a brand new machine costs three thousand, a one-year-old machine costs two thousand, a two-year-old costs uh, one thousand, and so on. So what would be the rate of return now if a capitalist were to invest in this machine? Well, he would have to initially save up $3,000 to buy it brand new. Then he would rent it out. He would get $1,000 from the person renting it, but the price of the machine would have dropped $1,000 in the meantime. And so then if you applied that rate of return formula, you would see that the numerator would be zero because it would be $1,000 plus, and then in parentheses, 2,000 minus 3,000, which is minus 1,000. And so that numerator would be zero. So the calculated rate of return would be exactly zero. And again, just to see it most obviously, if he starts out with $3,000 and waits the full three years, he gets 1,000 here, 1,000 here, and 1,000 here, and so what does he end up with $3,000? Exactly what he pumped into it in the beginning. All right, so the, the point of this demonstration, just to give you the big picture, is it can't be true that the reason someone here can earn 10% is that the machine is productive because by assumption the machine is just as productive here, it's still earning these rental prices of $1,000 per year, but yet the rate of return to a capitalist who invests in this is still zero. Okay, so this isn't the way Bumbavark um, made his argument, but this is the essence of his argument. The idea is that what you need to worry about, it's not merely the physical output or even the value of the output that determines the rate of interest. What determines interest is what is the rate of output or value creation relative to the initial um, value, okay? And so if the value of the capital stock is decreasing over time, the issue is, is what's being produced more valuable than the amount of capital that's being worn out in the production process, all right? So that was what I just said was closer to the way Bambavik phrased his critique, but that's the idea. Okay, to give you just two more examples to hopefully illustrate the point in a different way. Suppose now we start back out in this scenario, and I'm going to say suppose the machine all of a sudden is twice as productive. So maybe somebody's walking by and he sees that there was a wire sticking out, and he sticks it back in, and now all of a sudden the machine produces twice as much stuff as it did before. Well, what would happen, and I'm just going to reproduce these numbers with a 10% rate of interest, but now the machine cranks out twice as much stuff. Well, here you would still get zero. Here you would get a $2,000 rental payment and a $2,000 rental payment and a 2000 and back to zero. And then if you went through and capitalized the present discounted value of the machine, you would find, so here it would be zero, here it would be zero, and then here it would be now the present value of $2,000 discounted 10%, and it would be roughly 18, 18.18, 18, and then this number is 34.7107, and this finally is 49.7370. Okay, so what's the point of going through this? Well, it's just to show you the relation between um, rents and, and interest, is that here the machine is twice as productive, and so that's why the rental prices in each of these years is twice as big as it was here, okay, because the machine's physically producing twice as much stuff, and so the revenue to the person who's using it is $1,000 more than it was up here. So that's why if there's competition, he's got to pay $2,000 to hire it, okay? And also, the purchase price of the machine is double here relative to here, okay? So a brand new machine, if you go through and check, this number is twice that number, if I did the calculations correctly, and this number is twice that and that number is twice that. So yes, if a machine's more productive, that explains something, but what it explains is the purchase price of the machine or the rental price. 
What it does not explain, though, is the rate of return. Because, again, I calculated these numbers using a 10% rate of interest, plugging into that formula. And if you went through and did it forwards and said, okay, if someone buys this machine new, uses it for one year, gets 2000 and then sells it off, what's his rate of return? It would, again, be 10%. Okay, not 20%. So the point is, and this goes along with what Dr. Herbner was saying, the productivity of capital goods explains their prices and their rental rates for their services. It does not explain the rate of return over time to a capitalist who invests in them. So where do these numbers come from? So in these examples, I'm just asserting, let's suppose the rate of interest is 10% or let's suppose it's zero. Where they come from is time preference, according to the Austrians. Okay, so as Dr. Herbner explained, the interaction in the time market of people who either want to consume earlier or who are willing to consume later so long as they're offered an appropriate premium, that's going to determine what the market rate of interest is. And then knowing that, you then go ahead and figure out the capitalized value of, <coughs> of capital goods. Okay, let me give you one more example just to show you why the classical school was, was imprecise. And over here what I'm going to be doing is again a similar thing, but now I don't have in mind a machine. I have in mind a piece of land, okay? And so land offers a perpetual flow of cash. So let's suppose you bought this parcel of land in 2004, and then every year after, you can get a $1,000 rental payment from a, a sharecropper or something, okay? And that continues indefinitely. So you get nothing when you first buy it, and then every year thereafter, you get a flow of $1,000 per year. Okay, and then it would keep going on. And then the issue is, if we have a 10% rate of interest, what would be the capitalized value, the purchase price of that parcel of land? Well, again, using that formula, and it's, it goes off to infinity, so you'd have to know a little bit about math to understand how it works. But you could use that, and you would find that every year, again, assuming the rate of interest is 10%, the purchase price of this land would just be $10,000. Okay, so the, the price would not be diminishing over time. Okay, and so then if you want to calculate the rate of return, you say, okay, initially I have to pay 10 grand to get this parcel of land, and then next year I get a $1,000 payment from my sharecroppers, and the land's capital value is still 10,000, so what's my rate of return? Well, it's 1,000 over 10,000, so it's 10%. Okay, and so this really shows the flaw in the classical view because, yes, the person who owns this parcel of land is getting $1,000 per year. And so if we want to say, where's that income coming from? It's, it's true to say, oh, it's because the land is productive and people are paying him for the use of its services. But at the same time, he's also earning a 10% rate of return on his invested capital. Okay, so it's, so it's the connection between rents and interest due to capitalization in terms of present value. It all goes together. It's not that you can just have one part of the theory that explains interest payments and another that explains <coughs> rental payments. Because it's the same $1,000 payments that depending on which point of view you look at it, you could say, oh, that's an interest payment or you could say that's a rental payment. It's the same thing. It's just that depending on how you're accounting for it, you would call it one or the other. Okay, let me make one other point. And that has to do with this notion of causality. And so we've got that plot of land. And physically, it's generating crops in 2005, and then crops in 2006, and so on. Okay, so that's in terms of physical causality, yes. But then, economically, it's generating here $1,000 in rental value and $1,000. And then it's these things that are used to go back and then are capitalized into figuring out initially what's the price of this plot of land. Okay, so this $1,000 that's going to be coming due in one year 
adds nine hundred nine dollars and nine cents to this price. This thing that's two years in the future adds eight twenty six forty five. And if you kept doing it out, the numbers would get smaller and smaller, and eventually they would almost become zero. And then you would figure out that the total value right now, the purchase price of this, is ten thousand dollars. Okay. And so, in terms of the causality, what's the explanation? Yes, the plot of land is physically causing the production, but it's when we want to figure out how much does this thing cost. It's we say, well, what are these things going to be selling for? And then we use that information discounted by the appropriate. Uh, discount rate to figure out what the present value of this land is. Okay, now it's not that things in the future are literally going backwards in time. Really, what it is is someone here is forecasting and then thinking about what these are going to be in order to set the price. I mean, so the price of the plot of land is determined by supply and demand in the real estate market. But the point is how much people are willing to pay for it is influenced by their expectations about the. The future, okay. So that's uh, it's sort of complicated to understand the, the explanation of how um, causality works in this context. Okay, um, let me touch on one other point, and then I'll open it up if we have time left for questions. And that has to do with what Bumbavert called roundaboutness. And so what Lombardberg's principle was, was that uh, roundabout production processes are more physically productive. And what did he mean by this? Well, the idea was there are various techniques you could use to try to get what your ultimate consumption good is. So if we imagine if you're in the forest and you see some fruit on a tree, you can, and you have, you have labor at your disposal. And so the idea is, well, what do you want to do to get those apples, let's say? And so one thing you could do is you could directly go at it and try to either jump and grab them or maybe climb the tree and go ahead and get the apples directly. And so that would be a very direct application of your resources aiming towards your final goal. But a more roundabout way would be to first go and break a branch off of a tree and then maybe break some more branches off and somehow connect them together. Maybe you get um, vines and use them to tie the, the ends together and so you can construct a long pole and then after you do that, then you can go back to the tree and use the pole to start knocking down apples. Okay, and so in, from Bumbavert's point of view, the way he would look at it is he would say, your labor hours, if you invest them in a very short process, only yield a small amount of apples. Okay, so maybe if I directly just try to climb the tree and knock down apples, maybe I can get 100 apples after an hour of doing that. But if I instead invest my labor in first constructing this pole, then maybe on average my labor hours will yield me, let's say, 200 apples per hour. Okay, so that's what Bumbavert meant by the fact that roundabout processes are more physically productive. And he thought that was very crucial in understanding why is it that capital accumulation can make society richer. Okay, so because and this goes back to the original factors doctrine that ultimately there was a time when there were no capital goods. So at some point in the far distant past, there was just land and labor, the original factors of production, and then human beings created the first capital goods, and then time kept progressing. And so now there's virtually nothing that we make without using some form of capital. But originally there must have been just the original factors. And, that, um, and so to understand, for example, why is it that we can produce so much more with a machine Ultimately, the way Bumbavik would argue is that, well, in a sense, it's as if previous land and labor has all been accumulated into this machine. And so the, the labor hours that people used back in the 1500s when they were constructing axes and so forth was used in turn to enhance the productivity of labor up until now. And longer, more roundabout processes are more productive. OK, are there any quick questions on this stuff? No, I seem to have induced a coma yet again. Oh. <laughs> this uh, this logic that you're using, mm -hmm. can this, so this can be, can this be used to establish prices for consumer goods, or are we just talking capital goods here? Um, well, it does. Like if you're talking about a durable consumer good, so yes, a house 
if you wanted to, con you, what you want to do is you figure out, well, how much am I willing to pay for a house that will last me 20 years? Yeah, you would think, what are its services over 20 years, and then discount that in terms of the present price. But it's, you can't quantify the subjective happiness you get from living in the house, and so it's not, you can't literally use a formula like that, but certainly Frank Fetter thought that the, the principle was the same, that when you want to figure out how much is a house worth to me now, you're taking into account its future flows of service, but you discount them.